Muy buenas tardes, soy Joaquín Villarino, presidente ejecutivo del Consejo Minero y quiero darles una cordial bienvenida al seminario anual del Consejo Minero, el que este año lleva por nombre El Valor de Escucharnos. Elegimos este nombre eh, ya que Chile vive una etapa que marcará su desarrollo futuro de manera esencial. En esta etapa, la participación de actores muy diversos obliga a un esfuerzo extraordinario en la construcción de espacios de diálogo y la búsqueda de acuerdos que nos permitan dar soluciones realistas a los grandes desafíos de nuestro país. El estallido social, el cambio climático, la crisis sanitaria y la elaboración de una nueva constitución demandan respuestas novedosas que debemos construir con diálogo franco, generosidad y seriedad. Desafíos complejos como los señalados no se solucionan con respuestas simples. Solo en base a estos grandes acuerdos podremos retomar nuestra senda para transformar a Chile, a nuestro país, en un país desarrollado, sustentable y con mayor igualdad. En este contexto, nuestro principal desafío como Consejo Minero para el año 2022 es aportar información, fundamentos técnicos, para que como país logremos consensuar lo más pronto posible un nuevo marco regulatorio para el desarrollo de proyectos de inversión y para la operación de las empresas que tenga las características de sustentabilidad, estabilidad y certeza e incentivo al crecimiento de las actividades económicas en general y especialmente para la minería. Este desafío se presenta de cara a los contenidos económicos y del entorno de negocios que se discuten para la nueva constitución, así como respecto de la implementación del programa del gobierno electo en, los, en estos aspectos. Lo haremos como siempre, generando diálogos e información, relacionándonos con grupos de interés, generando alianzas de trabajo y comunicando lo que hacemos y pensamos de manera muy transparente. El aspecto más urgente eh, del desafío anterior se refiere a la regulación que tendrá la minería en la nueva constitución. La justificación de nuestra propuesta es simple y directa. Primero, el sector minero es indispensable para que Chile avance hacia un mayor bienestar y equidad. Aporta más de la mitad de las exportaciones del país, un quinto de las inversiones, un décimo del PIB, siendo la actividad que más impuestos paga en el país. A través del encaminamiento productivo, además, por cada 100 pesos de PIB minero, las empresas proveedoras del sector aportan otros 71 pesos al PIB. Además de estos aportes económicos, existen varios otros en diversos ámbitos y que son ampliamente conocidos. Segundo, por sus altas inversiones, extensos plazos en que éstas pueden ser recuperadas, inciertos resultados, especialmente en la actividad exploratoria y otras características propias, la medida requiere de una regulación estable, cierta y específica en varios aspectos. El haber contado con este tipo de normas ha sido causa fundamental del éxito de esta industria y del gran aporte que ha hecho al país. Tercero, la nueva constitución debería contener, en consecuencia con lo que hemos señalado, normas que garanticen los intereses del Estado respecto de los minerales, como la declaración del dominio de este sobre todas las minas, normas que otorguen a su vez seguridad y estabilidad a quienes desempeñan actividades mineras como el establecer que el Estado podrá otorgar a las personas las concesiones necesarias para explorar y explotar las sustancias minerales, incluyendo las facultades, obviamente, para usar, gozar y disponer de ellas. Y normas referidas a la protección medioambiental y al desarrollo social, con miras a la sustentabilidad sectorial y del país. La nueva Constitución debería contener normas efectivas, evidentemente, para la protección del medio ambiente, que permitan el bienestar de todas las personas así como brindar las condiciones para que la minería siga contribuyendo a los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible establecidos por la Organización de las Naciones Unidas. En resumen, Chile seguirá necesitando del aporte de su minería y para que esto se verifique, esta actividad, por sus características, debe estar regulada de una cierta forma, estando lo más esencial contenido en la nueva Constitución. Existe a este respecto una iniciativa de norma popular o iniciativa popular de norma para la nueva constitución 
que desarrolla los contenidos anteriores y está liderada por Compromiso Minero, red de la cual el Consejo forma parte. Los invitamos a apoyarla para que superemos las 15.000 firmas y pueda ser considerada por la Convención Constitucional. ¿Pero qué es Compromiso Minero? Bueno, somos una red de organizaciones que forman parte del sector minero chileno, de su ecosistema y que se encuentran vinculadas con estos. Es una red que tiene como objetivo estratégico acercar el sector minero a los chilenos y colaborar en el desarrollo sustentable de este. De hecho, cada una de las instituciones que forman parte de Compromiso Minero, minero de alguna manera tenían ya incorporada en su objeto social uno o más de estos propósitos. Ahora estamos haciendo un trabajo más colaborativo. Tal vez hayan visto alguna de las piezas de nuestra campaña comunicacional del mismo nombre que se difunde desde septiembre pasado. Los invito a verlas si no las han visto. Existe una página web de Compromiso Minero donde la podrán encontrar. Se trata de una red que ya tiene más de 75 adelantes y entre estos hay compañías mineras pequeñas, medianas y grandes, hay proveedores de la minería de todos los tamaños, emprendedores del sector minero, asociaciones gremiales que representan a las empresas anteriores, colegios que reúnen a profesionales y técnicos de disciplinas mineras, organizaciones no gubernamentales vinculadas con el desarrollo de esta actividad, gremios de otras actividades económicas de regiones mineras, entidades educativas, de formación, de estudios, de innovación y de tecnología. En, este, en, en esta red tenemos como metas para este año ampliar y consolidar la red Compromiso Minero, posicionarlo como una interlocutora clave con autoridades, actores de otros sectores e incrementar los temas e iniciativas que abordaremos, los adherentes colaborativamente. Para conocer aún más quiénes son parte de esta red, los invitamos a ver el siguiente video. Muchos habrán escuchado la frase, Chile es un país minero. ¿Pero qué significa realmente? Los habitantes de nuestro territorio han vivido de la minería desde tiempos inmemorables. La historia de esta tierra está vinculada profunda e indisolublemente con nuestros importantes yacimientos minerales. Este conocimiento ha sido traspasado por generaciones. Cada una de ellas tuvo que enfrentar enormes desafíos para construir a pulso y con determinación una industria cada vez más relevante para nuestro desarrollo. Por siglos, la minería ha sido el principal motor de crecimiento, permitiendo un desarrollo permanente y en la última década sustentable en nuestro territorio. La minería está enraizada en la identidad, historia y territorio de nuestro país. Gracias al esfuerzo sostenido de todos quienes son y han sido parte de esta industria, le debemos haber construido una minería de clase mundial. Una que desde el corazón de las regiones mineras aporta más del 14% del Producto Interno Bruto de Chile. Hoy más de 650.000 personas trabajan en torno a la minería. Son esas mujeres y hombres quienes están llamados a superar una vez más nuevos desafíos. El camino para construir una industria cada vez más sustentable, tecnológica e inclusiva presenta grandes desafíos, complejos, pero estamos ocupados en superarlos colaborativamente. Lo haremos para honrar el compromiso que la minería le hizo a Chile hace muchas décadas. Cada generación trabajará por superar sus propios obstáculos, para aportar cada vez más y mejor al desarrollo de nuestro país. La minería y sus proveedores siempre han estado del lado de las personas especialmente cuando más lo han necesitado. Así ha brindado apoyo y colaboración durante la pandemia por COVID, en el terremoto del 27 de febrero y muchas otras catástrofes pasadas que nos han unido como pueblo. Nuestra industria ha estado ahí y lo seguirá estando. Con esa motivación y porque forma parte de nuestra vida e historia, la Red Compromiso Minero nace a principios de septiembre de 2021 para dar a conocer nuestro compromiso con el desarrollo de las personas y del país. Hoy ya somos más de 70 adherentes de diversos rubros, universidades, colaboradores, proveedores, agrupaciones de profesionales, emprendedores, startups, asociaciones, gremios y empresas de la pequeña, mediana y gran minería estatal y privada. La red Compromiso Minero es diversa como en la gran familia minera, Incluye no solo a quienes trabajan en la extracción de minerales, sino a todos y todas 
quienes son parte del extenso ecosistema de nuestra industria. Diversos, pero unidos por el deseo de abrir un diálogo directo con la comunidad para contar cómo ha cambiado y seguirá cambiando nuestra industria. Para reafirmar frente a las nuevas generaciones que hoy más que nunca nos comprometemos a seguir trabajando para fomentar el conocimiento, la innovación, la inclusión y el desarrollo sustentable de la minería de cara a los desafíos que tiene el país. Porque la industria ha dado pasos concretos para seguir avanzando en una minería comprometida con Chile, con sus comunidades, con la formación de sus trabajadores y trabajadoras, así como en el cuidado del medio ambiente y los desafíos que nos impone el cambio climático. Ese es nuestro compromiso minero. Actualmente, la minería en Chile usa menos del 4% del agua continental del país y estamos implementando nuevas tecnologías para que el agua utilizada en los procesos sea cada vez menor. Asimismo, estamos comprometidos con un mayor uso de fuentes renovables para hacer frente al cambio climático. De la mano conseguir promoviendo el liderazgo del país en la producción sustentable de minerales como el cobre y el litio, porque sabemos que los minerales de Chile son indispensables para un futuro bajo en carbono. Nuestro compromiso está también con una mayor incorporación de mujeres, el desarrollo de proveedores locales, la generación de empleos de la más alta calidad y seguridad, así como la formación de talento, considerando la inclusión y la diversidad. Por estas razones y muchas más, queremos acercar la minería a la ciudadanía para que conozca lo que hay detrás de este ecosistema minero, pero también para que sepa cómo nos hacemos cargo de nuestros pasivos ambientales, disminuimos nuestra huella ambiental e incorporamos nuevas tecnologías para una industria cada vez más segura. Porque compartimos un diagnóstico común al respecto, si bien en la última década la minería ha dado grandes pasos en todas sus áreas, muchas personas aún no conocen estos avances, lo cual nos impulsa a mejorar cada día más en comunicarlos y difundirlos. Para ello, Compromiso Minero se ha planteado un trabajo en torno a las personas, el medio ambiente, las comunidades, cambio climático, inclusión, talentos e innovación. En Compromiso Minero sabemos que son las personas y sus talentos quienes generan valor para Chile. Nos motiva a reconocer a las mujeres y a los hombres que son parte de esta industria, a la academia que genera conocimiento y formación, a las empresas que prestan servicio y generan una gran cadena de valor a los profesionales que aportan con sus capacidades y sus conocimientos. También a los desarrolladores tecnológicos que ayudan al sector a avanzar hacia una industria más sustentable. Y a los emprendedores e innovadores que imaginando nuevos usos para nuestros minerales crean valor agregado para Chile. También queremos destacar cuán importante es que Chile pueda alcanzar un diagnóstico y una visión común respecto de la minería y su cadena de valor. Estamos convencidos que construir una mirada común entre todas y todos hará de nuestra industria minera una industria más fuerte, a la altura de lo que el país o incluso el mundo necesitarán en las próximas décadas. La conformación de esta red es un importante paso en este camino, uno que se traduce en participación, en transparencia, en diálogo. Un camino en torno a la promoción de iniciativas concretas que van en línea con una industria minera moderna, competitiva, inclusiva y más diversa. Lo caminaremos con humildad y determinación, con esfuerzo y compromiso, como mineras y mineros que somos, siempre teniendo como norte la prosperidad y aspiraciones de las y los habitantes de Chile. Después de haber visto este interesante video que muestra qué es lo que es eh, compromiso minero, vamos a lo más importante quizás del de evento anual del Consejo Minero. Varias veces hemos hecho alusión a conceptos como escuchar, conversar, acordar, colaborar y palabras relacionadas. De hecho, Compromiso Minero es una alianza del sector y su ecosistema para ejercer estas acciones de mejor manera. Por esto, no es casualidad el perfil de nuestro conferencista de, este, de esta tarde. El doctor Ernesto Ciroli es un reconocido líder mundial en desarrollo económico local, también es fundador del Instituto Ciroli, organismo que promueve una relación perdurable entre las empresas locales y sus comunidades basados en la confianza, el respeto y la legitimidad social. Para el sector minero, estos temas son de máxima relevancia porque nuestras empresas están en un constante y estrecho relacionamiento con sus comunidades que construyen un grupo de interés absolutamente prioritario. Como sector, hemos aprendido mucho en este proceso desde que comenzamos, pero sin duda que todavía tenemos mucho más que avanzar. Confiamos en que el doctor Ciroli nos ilumine 
nos habilite a todos para desempeñar de forma más efectiva el rol que nos corresponde jugar a cada uno en la solución de los múltiples desafíos del sector minero y del país. Hello Ernesto, nice to see you again and thank you very much for being with us. Uh, it's just fantastic to be here with you. <laughs> it's incredible uh, that in this moment that is probably uh, um, one of the most uh, uh, important uh, political moments in the history of Chile, um, I've been invited to address uh, your Consejo Minero uh, and a, such an important industrial field. So I'm really honored. <laughs> I know your beautiful country. I've been there uh, uh, a number of times. I have uh, Chilean friends. It's uh, really absolutely extraordinary it's to be invited today uh, at the beginning of 2022. So thank you very much for the invitation. You're, you're very welcome, uh, Ernesto. You have the floor. Thank We you very much. Um, what I said is, uh, is I need to pinch myself in 10 years since I gave uh, a memorable uh, TED talk in uh, 2012. In 10 years, um, uh, our life has been completely uh, disrupted by the response that uh, we had to a 17 minutes talk Um, uh, it was a TED talk organized in Christchurch, New Zealand. And 10 years ago, I did not know <laughs> what TED, uh, the platform TED was. And I did not even want to give the talk. It was my wife, Marta, who said, you should go and give a talk. You've been invited and you have to tell what you've been doing. Um, And I was so convinced that nobody uh, would ever uh, see my talk that uh, uh, when I arrived in New Zealand, I was jet lagged. I arrived from uh, Italy by California. And when I arrived there, uh, I basically um, spoke my mind. Um, I had uh, experienced a number of years working in Africa for the Italian government in programs uh, of local development. And all our programs uh, were failing in Africa because we would arrive, arrive to tell people what to do. We will never listen to the local people And uh, as soon as uh, our money will run out, people will go back to do what they were doing before we arrived. But sometimes our mistakes were so ridiculous, they could have been avoided so easily. And <laughs> in the 2012 TED talk, I told the story that has gone around the world now. That TED Talk has been seen uh, some four million times. And uh, the story of the us Italians arriving in a community in Zambia and teach the Zambian people to plant Italian tomatoes uh, <laughs> has been uh, <laughs> is now pretty well known because the tomatoes grew beautifully, but as soon as the tomatoes were nice and ripe, the hippos came out from the river, from the Zambesi River, and they ate all the tomatoes. <laughs> so we Italians, we have spent millions to go there, build the factory, the farm, the equipment, training the local people. And we had never asked the local people, how come <laughs> you don't grow anything here? Only when the hippos ate the tomatoes, <laughs> then we said to the local people, oh my God, the hippos, did you know about it? 
And the local people said, yes, that's why we have no agriculture here. <laughs> and we thought, why didn't you tell us? <laughs> you never asked. So what I said in my uh, TED talk basically were two things. One, be very, very careful to arrive uninvited and tell people what to do because you are ignoring local knowledge, skills, experience, profound wisdom linked to the territory. But the other thing that then I said was that experience obliged me to find another way. And for the last 40 years, the Siroli Institute uh, has developed a practice of development in response, a kind of a way for corporations, governments to use, to be able to extract knowledge, motivation, passion that is available in every community uh, to help develop a community in a cooperative way. So what happened when I gave my TED talk? <laughs> I gave the 17 minute talk, went back to California thinking, nobody will ever watch it. Instead, I received a telephone call from the TED organization in New York City to say, Ernesto, we review all the tech TEDx speeches around the world, and we like yours. And we want to put it on our platform, which is the TED platform. And from that month on, I had 100,000 viewers a month. Why? I could not understand what, kind, what did I touch? What kind of sore spot I touched? And I have to tell you that two different kinds of people and industries came to speak to me. The first one where every organization in the world <laughs> that had to do with local development and all the international aid organizations. I had people calling me to say, oh my God, Ernesto, <laughs> nobody talks about mistakes that we make. Nobody ever admits that they've done something wrong. Because if they say that their international aid organization has done something wrong, they lose the funding. So you are the first person to admit that you Italian international aid agencies made mistakes. Let me tell you what we did. <laughs> so I have had so many hundreds of people calling me to tell me about their mistakes. And some of the mistakes are hilarious, are worse than <laughs> the hippos. This guy came from the American Peace Corps. And he said to me, Ernesto, <laughs> We were in Guatemala, and there was this village that had very good agriculture, but then there was a very uh, rough river uh, that in stopped them from selling goods to the people from the other side of the river. So we arrived there, and we said to them, we are going to build you 
a bridge. And the local people said, you cannot build a bridge here. And the guy said, we are Americans. We are the Peace Corps. We are going to build you a bridge. So all the local people said, OK, <laughs> show us. <laughs> and the guy said, Ernesto was a nightmare. Because on the other side, there were no roads. So first, it was jungle. So first, we had to go 30 miles, cross the river, come back, build a road. And then, how do you build a bridge? You have to build a big ramp on one side, a big ramp on the other side, and then you span the bridge. So the guy said, Ernesto, we spent six months building this huge ramp, you know, fantastic, beautiful ramp on one side of the bridge. And the rainy season came, and the river moved this bank one mile. So now they had the ramp over nothing. And the guy said to me, what kills me, Ernesto, is that in 4,000 years, there will be an American anthropologist going through the jungle of Guatemala, and he will come up to the ramp. <laughs> and he will say, wonder, wonder what the indigenous people did with the ramp. Maybe it's pointing to Orion, you know? And my story has been filled with this kind of real mistakes in what happens if you do not listen to the local people and the local wisdom. So the immediate reaction was people saying, Ernesto, you have no idea how liberating it's been for us to be able to share, even internally, what the things that we have done wrongly. A group of students from the University of Toronto created a platform called Fail Forward, where they invited anybody involved in international development programs to tell the story of what did not work. Because they said, how can we go and try to do community work without hearing what not to do? And nobody's teaching us what not to do. The other group of people who came to speak to me were the people interested in social and economic community development. I had described what we did for 30 years before, <laughs> what we started to do. What we started to do was to use a completely different approach to local economic and social development based on a new psychology. The world is changing, and there are new technologies being developed and, and utilized. Ten years ago, I did not believe in social media. Look at us today. I'm in California. You, I'm speaking to you in Chile. Ten years ago, we would have not done this. Look at the new technology in mining. Look at what's happening in the world of digitalizing the world. Well, there are new social technologies. And there are pioneers of new social technologies. What I had done, I had discovered 
the work of a psychologist called Carl Rogers. And what I did, I took that kind of understanding to the field of economic development. Carl Rogers was the pioneer of a system of belief that is called third force psychology. The first force in psychology is Freudianism. And the first force of psychology uh, is what has created modern psychology. The second force of psychology is behaviorism and is a belief that we can motivate people and we can create a fantastic society through positive and negative reinforcement. You behave well, we compensate you. You misbehave, we punish you. Third for psychology uh, believes in something that is breathtaking. It is so beautiful <laughs> that when I encountered that, uh, I thought this may be the solution to what we have been desperately seeking. How do you foster local, social, economic prosperity and development? What do the pioneers of this, so, this new social technology say? They have <clears throat> a view of humanity that it is so fantastic because they say that every single healthy human being as a dream and the dream is always the same the dream is always to better themselves so the people listening to us now today they have a dream and the dream is to have more and as soon as they have more, the dream is to become better. Better mother, better fathers, you know, better citizen. The dream is to become the beautiful human being that you know in your heart to be. So if everybody has a dream, there is no need to motivate them. What you do, <laughs> you sit with them to say, what's your dream? And you discover that if you create a relationship where they trust you and they invite you to their kitchen and you sit at the kitchen <laughs> and you say, my job is to help people transform the dream into reality, they tell you the dream. And once you know what the dream is, you are halfway there to help them fulfill it. You get Signora uh, Maria uh, uh, in, uh, you know, in, in central Colombia. Uh, she and her husband, they make, uh, um, uh, tortillas, and then the husband, uh, arepas, <laughs> Colombian arepas, <laughs> they make a arepas in the morning, uh, the two of them in the kitchen, and when they finish cooking the arepas, the husband takes the arepas on the, on the scooter, on the, on the motor, and he goes to sell the arepas. And they come to our enterprise facilitator, and they say, we poor. We can barely survive. And the enterprise facilitator says, um, do you love 
making a repast, uh, the lady says, oh, absolutely, that's the, we make the best arepas in the village. Do people like your arepas? He said, oh, they love the <laughs> arepas. We could sell many more arepas, but we do not have the time to make them and to take them to them. So the enterprise facilitator says, why, who loves to make them? Senora Maria says, I like to make the arepas. <laughs> and the husband says, I like to sell them. Why don't you divide the roles? Senora Maria, you have a vecina who can come and you can teach her how to make arepas so the two of you only cook arepas? Can your husband start to sell double the arepas from tomorrow? And they said, yeah, yeah, we could do that. So why don't you do that? Do you know somebody who can help you with finance to calculate exactly, you know, how much you have now you have to pay for the vicina? So oh, yeah, we can, we can find somebody like that. So six months later, they were buying a house. The Senora Maria was crying at the public meeting. And the corporation <laughs> that had paid the enterprise facilitator in six months had 18 families whose life had been changed by listening to the dreams of the person. So the people who came to speak to me where the people say, oh my God, Ernesto, we absolutely need you because we are not listening to that uh, uh, micro level. We are not engaging to the, with the individual, we are engaging with communities. So all of a sudden I get invited by the, the Center for Sustainable Mining at the University of Queensland in Australia, and I'm running classes for the mineral sector about something that until that, that time was not about uh, mining at all. I, you know, working for construction companies, uh, cement companies, uh, working around the world with whoever had an interest in the success and prosperity of those communities. After the TED talk, 25 universities, uh, industrial groups, uh, we have spoken to, and you know, look, look at the importance right now of license to operate, and look at what the triple bottom line requires. We are talking at economic, social, and environmental uh, response. So it's been for us an us, uh, extraordinary 10 years where we have also been able to join forces with other practitioners of Rogerian psychology. Who are the other practitioners? There is an absolutely extraordinary group of people that they are dealing uh, with uh, the listening in other professions. And there is a group, uh, it's called Bright Spotting. And Bright Spotting <laughs> is about <laughs> arrive in, this, in, in a place that is full of problems and find out who are the individuals in that community who are prospering. How? What are they doing that is different from the other people? And this group started in many, many, many years ago doing some international aid work, and they were trying to solve the problem of uh, starvation in Vietnamese villages after the war, 
the Vietnamese War. And they arrived in a village where so many children were starving, and they thought that what they had to do was to bring food constantly. And then they noticed that there were some children there belonging to some of the poorest families who were well fed. And they said, how, <laughs> how is this possible? What are these mothers doing? And they interviewed those poor, illiterate peasant women in Vietnam. And they discovered that those women were going through the rice paddies fishing for shrimps and crabs. And they were mixing uh, uh, proteins into with the rice, and the children were better fed than the children of wealthiest people. And they said, can you teach this? Now, we have some very sophisticated doctors in America bright spotting uh, among people with diabetes in major hospitals to say, how come certain people have learned how to control their diabetes B? So what the, instead of the, say, we are experts and we know what they do, they go and in, meet these people, the people with the best possible medical outcomes to find out what they are doing. And it's absolutely extraordinary the wisdom that is diffuse, that exists at the grassroots. So I have to uh, say that, <laughs> that these last 10 years for me have been an extraordinary confirmation that uh, being invited in the headquarters of some of the major mineral, account, mineral uh, organization, extractive uh, organizations in the world, to be able to speak to all the personnel about the importance of creating a relationship where you look at the community as a community full of fantastic people with their own dream and be able to create something that is so easy. It's a salary of a person who listens and discover that we can be taken around the world in divided communities, fighting each other. And we arrive there. And instead of concentrating on the people that is, are fighting, you concentrate on the people who have their own dreams. And you help them create a fantastic uh, local economy and society. As soon as you do that, the corporation is seen as a partner in the development of that region. It's been very rewarding. This year will be 10 years since that TED talk. To be here with you today, you just ex express in your presentation how important how transformational these times are for your country. Yesterday, I had a conversation with a group of Italian investors, and they told me about the importance of Chile for, through the European eyes. They know how important Chile is in South America. Here, the, in, in North America, Chile has always been seen as the most advanced country in, uh, in South America, and it's been seen as a beacon. So I am honored to be here with you. I would like to take some questions from you if you have any questions. Uh, but I would like to conclude by saying one thing. The extractive sector is better positioned to become a partner in local economic and social development than any international aid agency or NGO. Why? Because you live there. 
for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, you will be there in that community. Imagine if from the very first day you would say, our vision is to become partners in your development. We will create more jobs outside of the mine than inside the mine by helping you do beautifully what you love to do. You, we are going to help farmers. We are going to help uh, entrepreneurs. We are uh, helping youth entrepreneurs, women who want to do their own thing. So that when the ore will be extinguished and we will go away as a corporation, we are going to leave behind a diversified economy that is prosperous and sustainable. So I believe that you, as an industry, as you said, you said in the beginning that uh, is one of the drivers of the Chilean economy. I believe that you should use that incredible opportunity to become partners in the development of local economies, bringing social and environmental concerns and lifting Chile to become truly a beacon for South America. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Ernesto, for your very, very interesting speech. Uh, now I, I would like to delve into some topics you mentioned in your presentation, terms like uh, listening dreams, recognition of mistakes, building trust with communities are very important for our industry and, and of course for the country. We as an industry must recognize that we have made some mistakes during our life and, and maybe the first step is to recognize that. Uh, let me ask you a, a question related to the work with communities where you can find uh, more than one company or, or more than one uh, industry. In some cases, we have small towns, small communities with too many companies around it. So the question is how we manage the work among the companies trying to help people in the, uh, in the dreams, in the find a way they, yeah. they can enlighten their dreams. I was invited to uh, go to Brazil uh, uh, where I met <laughs> uh, a, a, a man Uh, who at that time was bigger than life. Uh, I had uh, uh, the adventure of uh, meeting uh, Ike Batista. At the time, uh, he was the richest man in Brazil. <laughs> uh, and uh, we were with an Australian, uh, a can a Canadian uh, mining company wanting to do something uh, on an existing um, uh, manganese mine. Uh, that uh, the Ike Batista control. And what we uh, talked about was to do a, collabor a collaboration where two different minds will create a, uh, a, an organization to do enterprise facilitation. And when we arrived to visit the community, uh, it, it was an absolute revelation. Because what had happened in the community was that uh, Uh, there was a previous uh, mine that uh, before Ike Batista bought that uh, manganese mine, the previous company had been there for 45 years. And in 45 years, they had built the roads, uh, they had built the hospital, they had built the schools, uh, they have uh, created an electric grid to, to, have, uh, uh, to electrify the entire community community of 9,000 people. And when I arrived in, in, North Bra in Northern Brazil, that initial company had gone out of business for nine years. So in nine years, every single infrastructure that that mine had built had shut down. So the, the roads were impassable, there was no electricity, the hospital had shut down. The school was uh, had become a tiny little uh, rural school in in the, in, Bra in, the, in the jungle of Brazil, and when I arrived there, 
the local community said to me, don't build us infrastructures <laughs> unless you give us the money to make them run. Because if there is no money, we cannot pay for the doctors. We cannot pay for the electricity. So what we wanted to do was uh, uh, create an alliance. I believe that there is an opportunity right now for three, four, five, ten companies to say, OK, we do a collaborative project. We create a foundation for the development of that region. We employ two, three, four enterprise facilitators. And these two, three uh, enterprise uh, facilitators uh, represent these ten companies in working with local entrepreneurs, social enterprises, uh, environmental projects, and you share the vision. We are here for 20, 30, 40 years. We are going to help the local people uh, do beautifully what they love to do. Mm, and, um what do you think is the best way to involve the local authorities in this process? And which is the way that we can, <laughs> that we can deal with, in some cases, with NGOs that they are not, are not always present there? Uh, um, maybe they are fighting for their own dreams instead of for the people's dreams. I don't exactly know. Exactly. Which look, is the right way look, to, to work with... The with right way, first of all, first of all, my... When I get invited by a corporation, the first thing I said to the corporation is that the enterprise facilitator who listen to people for free and in confidence, paid by the corporation, has to carry the logo of the corporation, the name of the company. And they, the corporation said, no, 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 Ernesto, <laughs> it's too dangerous. <laughs> we would like the person to be employed by somebody else. And I said, no, because this person will be loved so much that you want that person to be your person. Are you kidding me? That person is going to help your daughter do well with her, with her business? The sun, those group of 100 cafeteros will be helped to find international market by your person, and you don't want your person to be represented. So you have to be proud of the enterprise facilitator. And how do you deal with local authorities? You go to the local authorities, like I've done, in, uh, uh, in central Colombia, where we had to go with an armed escort. The, the alcaldia, the office of the alcalde was in a square that was festooned with anti-company slogans. This was an, an energy company, not extractive. This was a sustainable energy company and yet was hated and we went to see the alcalde and i said to the alcalde alcalde i would like the corporation to help all the people in your community who have a dream for a business to do well but i will not do it unless you Invite me. And I said, you see this face? Uh, La cara. You, <laughs> you see this face? You will never see me again unless you invite me. The corporation is ready to do this project. But if you say no, I will not come here. I receive two page long formal letter of invitation from the alcaldia of that community to say, this is something very important to us. That the, that the uh, opportunity is for everybody. That you are not giving money that divides people. In six years, the community is fighting each other because of money. 
And instead, what we are going to offer is technical support to any social enterprise, any commercial enterprise, any group of farmers, any group of artisans who want to use their own know-how, their own skill, and create something in parallel. So uh, yes, you involve, you talk to the local authority to say, would you like us to do this? Um, and what about the role of NGOs in this conversation? Look, I have had uh, uh, a terrible time in my life with NGOs. Because what happens with NGOs is that they have an agenda. And if they are not local, then they arrive the way I arrived in Africa for an Italian NGO. We always conceive the plan and the scheme in our own office in Rome. <laughs> we arrived in Africa knowing what to do. We never listened. So if you want to work with, uh, if you want to work with an NGO, you have to have a very good conversation with them. And they say, you want us to fund you? We would like you to be respectful. And what is happening now is that finally, after my TED talk, after the invitation from the industry, now I have major NGOs coming to me to say, maybe we have to rethink ourselves, you know, how we promote development. So don't, don't feel captive. I believe the mining companies have a better chance to uh, uh, train the community, uh, the corporate social responsibility personnel in person-centered, client-centered counseling techniques. And it will be very simple to do so. And then you will have people who are there to discover the gems in the community. So uh, don't, don't feel that you are lesser than NGOs, that you have to rely on somebody who has ethical values that they are more capable to express. You know, be proud. Assume responsibility to become a good partner in the communities, and you don't need intermediaries. Thank you, Ernesto. Um, the, for the time, maybe our last question will be related to the rebuild of trust. In some cases, we have to recognize that we have made mistakes, important mistakes in some cases, and communities just don't want to have any talk with us. And which is the best way to rebuild trust after you have made a mistake? Which is the best you way cannot, uh, to rebuild trust? You, can, you cannot do it by talk. You have to start to act. Uh, and what you do, you, um, uh, we have done it time and time and time uh, uh, again uh, with uh, all sorts of industries. Uh, and what we do, we <clears throat> start to work very quietly in the community. We don't advertise what we're doing. We train uh, people who uh, are then uh, uh, who live in the community, they know the culture, they know the language, and they start to work with people who uh, are total, uh, totally neutral uh, or uh, towards the company. And we offer free, confidential, caring, competent support to anybody, uh, the families, the children, anybody who has a dream to do something entrepreneurially. Uh, and we go public only when we have the very first uh, Signora Maria, <laughs> the very first person with tears to say, these people have absolutely transformed my life. These are good people. 
only when you have the first local person that you have helped transform his life, uh, her life, you go on to that person to say, Signora Maria, how do you think, what do you think of this project? Do you think that other people in this community could use the help that we have given you? And if Signora Maria says, yes, I believe this is a fantastic uh, program, we then ask Signora Maria, would you tell your story? Can we capture your story uh, to introduce this methodology to the entire community? And what we do, we do uh, the beginning uh, until that time is a media blackout. From the day we have local people saying, this is fantastic, we go public. So it's a methodology. We have worked in some of the most difficult communities in the world. So uh, we've been there. <clears throat> and uh, you shift your focus. Now is the 80-20. <clears throat> you spend 80% of your time on 20% of the population that uh, doesn't like you. And what we are saying is, is that we want to spend time with the 80% of, uh, of the community who are uh, neutral, uh, who don't have any problem with you. They are trying to make a living. So we address the people who are right now are invisible. The people who never upset you, <laughs> who never talk to you, they are trying to make a living with the craft, with the art, with the agriculture, and uh, you are ignoring them because they're quiet. Instead, they become our customers. Did I answer you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did. Well, uh, Ernesto, thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting and inspiring presentation in which we learn about the international experience on the relationship between companies and communities, especially in this moment that require greater conversation, transparency and trust. Undoubtedly, your words will be of great help in this challenging process that our country will experience and that it needs to face the challenges of the 21st century. Thank you very much again, Ernesto. Thank you to you for the invitation. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Muchas gracias a, a quienes fueron parte y nos acompañan eh, en este seminario. Esperamos que los desafíos y oportunidades que nos plantea Ernesto en materia de relacionamiento entre empresas y comunidades nos ayuden a mejorar nuestra forma de relacionarnos con el entorno y de relacionarnos entre nosotros. Un entorno que es cambiante, exigente y que demanda sin lugar a dudas una forma distinta de hacer las cosas. El sector minero desde hace décadas está comprometido y hoy más que nunca con un desarrollo de la industria que vaya sin lugar a dudas de la mano con la sustentabilidad, con un desarrollo que cumpla con esos tres requisitos fundamentales que son el del crecimiento económico sin lugar a dudas, el del cuidado del medio ambiente y el del desarrollo social. De la mano de estos tres pilares, probablemente podremos construir un mejor país al cual la industria se debe y quiere ayudar y está comprometida. Estamos comprometidos en ello y queremos seguir avanzando en el desarrollo sustentable no solo del sector, sino del país. Muchísimas gracias por habernos acompañado una vez más en este seminario anual del Consejo Minero.